Okay. So this chapter, as you can see, we have something a little bit different than chapter four. In this chapter, we're talking about rigid body. So what do you think about rigid body? How is that different from particle kinetics? So whenever you see rigid body, and that means start from this chapter, we need to care about the shapes, the size of the body instead of treating it as a particle. And so where you apply the force on the body matters. So that's a key difference from um, between chapter four and chapter five. To get started on this chapter, I would like to start by looking at an example that is five, oops, this is too much. Let's look at example 5A11, 5A17. So we're gonna look at that, this example, and try to uh, introduce you why it matters, why we want to um, learn rigid body kin kinetics. So in this example, that's the example on your textbook. So we have a bar that is hanging down with a hinge, with a pin. So this bar, it's fixed at point O on the ceiling. And <clears throat> now we care about um, the size of the bar. So um, here I'll tell you that point is called G. That's a center of mass of that bar. It's called this OE, bar OE. And the length of this bar, the total length of the bar is L. And we know the masses of the bar is M. And <clears throat> at one point, um, this bar can rotate freely about point O. And so you can see that at one point, if we have a throw a ball to this bar, to hit the bar, and you will know after the impact, the bar is gonna swing um, to the right, right? So what we have here, the givens, this problem, uh, we know the mass of the rod, we know the mass of the ball, we also know the total length of the, the bar. What we want to find is, we want to find what is the distance h. h is the distance from O to where that bar the ball hit the bar. That's H. So we want to find what is this H that will make, um, make sure the reaction force at point O equals to zero on X direction. So we need to find what's the distance H to have reactions at O. Is zero on x direction. So we know there will be reaction forces acting at point O. There will be a one acting on the x direction and the reaction force acting on y direction. So we want to find where you should hit the bar with the ball in order to make sure that reaction forces is zero on x direction. So this is a, uh, the problem setup. And so when we look at this, where would you start to solve this problem? From what we um, been doing in chapter four, what's always the first step you need to solve a kinetic problem? Kinetic dealing with Newton's second law, F equals EM. So there, there, there are forces. So if there, there are forces in a problem, and the first thing we want to do is 
always start with free body diagrams. So free body diagram, it's somewhere we should start as a first step. So how would we draw the free body diagram for this problem? And you can t since we want to analyze the bar, everything's on a bar, that direction force is at a bar, the ball is hitting the bar, so we can take the bar OE. Start drawing all the forces on the bar. So what are the forces on this bar? First, we know G, point G, it's the center of mass. So the weight force, we're starting from, we're acting st from the point G, pointing downwards. It's called this weight force. And we know at point O, it's O, G, E. At point O, since now we isolate this bar, and but at point O, there's a pin joint to hold the bar, to support the bar. Therefore, we have reaction force there at point O. One reaction force, we can call this Ry. Another one is Rx. And also we know there's a ball is hitting the bar at some location um, with distance h. So there will be an impact force there. Okay, so this should be our free body diagram. And so that's the first step. And what's the second step we usually do right after a free body diagram? That's when you need to find your coordinate system. In this problem, I would just use x, y, and all i, j as our coordinate system. Now we finish the first two steps. And remember what we learned in chapter four and um, the chapter four A. Once we have the free body diagram coordinate system, the third step we can do is to starting to write forces in vector form. Look what we, all the forces we have on the free body diagram, and we can write all the forces in terms of the vector. So write forces in vector form. Let's see what forces we have, and let's start with the weight force, W. And we know the direction of weight force is pointing to negative J. So that should be negative, and the weight equals M rod times G. Um, that's on J direction. And also we know the um, F, the impact force from the ball. And that's pointing to positive I direction. So it's positive F. We don't know the, um, the, the value of F, but we know it's some forces on I direction. So just F, I, it's enough. We also know the forces um, at point O, the reaction force, or Y. Ry, of course, is on y direction. So that's we can express as Ryj. Similarly, Rx, that's the reaction force on x direction, equals Rxi. Okay, not too bad. Now we have the vector form of all the forces. But we don't know much. The only th thing we know is this uh, um, the weight force m rod times g. And, but don't worry, we're gonna solve the rest of the forces later. And once we have um, the third step, have all the forces in vector form. This is from Newton's law, F equals MA. We now have the force. Next, we want to have the vector form of our acceleration. And how to write our acceleration of the bar? Um, in vector form. So now you need to go back to analyze what is happening here. 
So the ball is throwing to the bar, is hitting the bar, it has an impact. So red at that impact, and do you, 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 do you know how the bar is gonna move? You know the bar is kind of like rotates about 0.0, right? But right at that moment during impact, the acceleration of this bar OE, um, it's on, only has component on I direction at that moment, at that position. Therefore, we don't know what's the value for the acceleration, but we know it's A, um, I direction. That's just right at this position at that moment. If the bar has a certain angle, and then your acceleration should have both I and J components. Okay. And here I would add a um, subscript for A. We'll say this is AG. So that means that's an acceleration um, from the center of mass. And this is something um, we didn't pay much attention to details in chapter four because we're, all we did was particles. But in this chapter, we're dealing with rigid body. So when you write your um, acceleration, always make sure your acceleration it's um, about that mass center G. So this should be always the acceleration of the mass center. So that's something to um, be careful. So if I would want to write my acceleration on my ROE, and I would do this, I would start from point G to draw the direction of my acceleration. Let's call this AG. Okay, once, now we have all the forces and we have um, acceleration in vector form. Next step we can do is to apply sum of forces equal to ma. Here is mag. Now we can put all the forces together. We have a force plus force, impact force plus ry plus Rx equals Mag. So this is a vector equation, right? We can break down any vector equations into its x and y or ij components. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna look at this vector equation on i direction and j direction. So if we look at this on I direction, what's the component of um, W on I direction? W, it's a wave force acting on J direction. So that's zero from W. If we look at this force F on the free body diagram, and it's only pointing on I direction. So on I direction, we have this force F. From this Ry, Ry is a reaction force on y direction, so it has no x components or i components. For Rx, that would be just Rx. This equal to um, Ma. What's Ag on i direction? That's just for Ag. Okay, now we're done with I direction. We can uh, focus on J direction. On J direction, we only have um, weight force, that's negative um, rod G. Okay, then another one is Ry plus Ry. 
and for acceleration, nothing is on J direction, so it's zero. Okay, now if you look at what we have so far, we have one equation, second equation, right? And those two equations are from Newton's second law F equals MA. And if you look at this two equation and what unknowns we have, we don't really know F, we don't know RX, we don't know RY, uh, we don't know what is AG. So there, we have much more unknowns. And so in this chapter, uh, chapter five, and there's another way we can build one more equation that is using um, moment. So as step five, this is kind of like step, the first part of step five, it's called F part A. And for part B of step five, we need to do some of the movement about point A. Equal to, and this is a new equation, equal to movement of inertia, IA times alpha, that is angular acceleration, plus R position vector, R G slash A cross product M A acceleration at that point. A. So this is the new equation we will apply after um, Newton's second law for movement. And this is also called Euler's second law. And something to pay extra attention is when you look at this equation, um, you need to pay attention to this subscript, subscript A, 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 A. So here it's sum of the movement about point A equals the movement inertia about point A times alpha plus the vector, um, position vector. Um, G slash A cross M uh, acceleration of point A. So this equation, it's about the point A you selected. It's about the same point, point A. And point A here is just a general point. And for this particular problem, then we need to define what's our, our which point we can use. We can either use point O, point G, or point E. But this is the general equation. You can replace A with any points you want. But make sure and um, you use them consistently. Make sure all of those parameters are in terms of A. So let's go deep, a little bit deeper into this ruler second law. First thing here in this equation, this I A. So I A, it's a mass, mass movement of inertia about A. And we can also define IA, the movement of inertia, with the mathematical expression. So capital I equals to integral of the whole mass of the rigid body, R squared dm. So that's the mathematic definition for movement inertia. This is for rigid body.
So it means no matter what shape you have, if this is a rigid body, um, you pick, let's see, this is point A. If you pick a point, point A, and what you're doing here is you just taking the small finite mass, let's call this small area DM, and you're using the distance between them to times this dm using the r squared times that dm r squared until you do this sum for the whole mass then you will get the um, mass movement of inertia and this movement of inertia um, indicates how mass is distributed about this point a in this rigid body, if that makes sense. And we can take an um, example uh, with a very thin bar. If we have a very long bar and the radius of this bar is small compared to its length, this is long cylinder bar so it basically means the radius of the bar is much smaller uh, when compared it to its length and if we call the end of this bar that point is called e and the total length of the bar is l and we can take a very small section on this bar a small area and call that dm and we can write using the mathematic equation to um, definition to find what's the movement inertia about point e so the movement of inertia about point e equals the integer of this bar x we call the distance it's called the distance here x x squared times dm. And since we assume the mass is um, no, it's evenly distributed along this bar, so we can actually see this dm equals m, the total mass of the bar, divided by l. So each small segment has this mass dm. Then we can rewrite this as integral from zero to L, the total length L times X squared times, you can replace dm here with M over L. Now our integral is in terms of dx. Then we can solve this. Is m over l is a constant. You can throw this outside to the integral. Then we get m over l x x squared becomes x cubic over three, and solve that from l to zero, and we get the movement of inertia about point e of this bar equals m. L square over three. So the mass movement of inertia of a long cylinder bar about its end, when n um, has this relation. This is about one end. E. And if you look at the movement inertia at different position, start from different point on this bar, you, you will get different movement inertia. For example, if uh, instead of looking at the movement inertia from the end at E, how about we look at the movement inertia right at that center mass? So still have the same bar. Now let's look at the movement inertia from it's called the center of mass G from point G. 
and the, cent the movement inertia about E is going to be equal to integral integral from G to this end, we have L over two. From G to the other end, you have negative L over two. So the range should be negative L over two to L over two times the what's inside of integral should be the same as this. So X square M L dx. Yeah, after you solve this, you find out the moment inertia about g, the center of mass equal to m l square over 12. So if you compare these two moment inertia, one is m l square over three, another one is m l square over 12, you will find out this moment inertia about the center mass g it's much smaller than this uh, moment in moment of inertia about e so if not if so the moment inertia that's just about the center mass ig it's always the smallest inertia hey uh, dr lu yep so like, we don't have to actually know how to derive these, right? Because aren't these just like in a table? Like you just look these up? Yes, correct. Um, you don't need to do the analyze to get the moment inertia. Those will be given in tables and you can easily search them online on Google. And they're all, people already done that many years ago. But it's good to know how, where did this moment inertia come from? So this moment inertia is at center mass. And it is always the smallest moment inertia. As we just did here, if you analyze this, start from the end E, and you end up with larger moment inertia than this. And another thing, it's you are able to find moment inertia for any shapes just by using what we call the parallel axis theory. to find moment inertia for any shape. And it goes, the theorem goes I, the moment inertia about A, equals the moment inertia about the center mass, Ig, plus mass times D square. So this Ig, the moment inertia about the center mass, um, center, you know, center of gravity are usually given for different geometry or shapes. And if you know that, and if you want to find any points, uh, the moment inertia for any points on that um, rigid body, you are able to use this equation to find that. And so the most common shape we're going to use in this class is for disk. and rings. So the moment inertia about center of gravity of a disk and ring are, will be mostly given for your problem and your exam as well. Because for the disk equals m r square over two. For rings can be m r square. Those are most um, commonly used moment of inertia in this class. Now let's go look at this uh, uh, Woodler's second law. Sum of all the moment goes by A. We just mentioned what is moment inertia and how to get it. 
Now let's look at a bigger picture about this ruler's second law. Okay, let's look at this second law here. Um, we can have different cases. For case one, what if our A, point A, it's point G. G here represents the center of mass. What if these two points are overlap? Then you end up with if you look at into this equation, if A and G are overlapping, this R A R G slash A, that's a position vector pointing from A, uh, start from A pointing to G, right? And if they're those two points are the same points, then this R G A is gonna be zero, if that makes sense. I will tell you R G A gonna be zero. And therefore, um, you only have the first term left in the in this equation. You end up with sum of the moment about point A equal to just the moment of inertia of A times omega, which is the angular acceleration. In this case, we can replace A by using G since they're the same point. Okay, that's the first case. If you have this case, it will simplify your equation and that was a much simpler equation instead of doing this cross product. For case two, it's when A, it's a fixed point. It's a fixed point on a rigid body. What does that mean when A is a fixed point? For example, we have a disc and I have a point A right here. I tell you that point A is fixed to a pin or something. That tells you this whole rigid body can rotate about point A. That point A is fixed, it doesn't move. So if we have a situation like this, then the acceleration at A is gonna be equal zero. And in um, under this scenario, we also need to can get rid of this second term to end up with sum of the, all the force plus movement equal to I A R phi. Okay. And make sure all the, the movement and the inertia here is about that fixed point right there. And we have another kiss. It's when A is the point Q, where AQ is parallel to RG slash Q. So when point A here, it's point, it's called Q, and where this AQ, AQ is the acceleration of point Q. It's parallel. Parallel to the position vector RG slash O slash Q. So if you look at the equation here, if we replace A with Q, then this term should be RG slash Q. And if this RG slash Q and the AQ are parallel, then what's the product of this cross product? What's the result of cross product for two parallel vector? And that would lead to zero. If you have two things, two vector are parallel to each other and you try to cross product them, and you end up zero. 
under that case, you will have some of the forces about Q equals IQ alpha. That makes sense. So this is kind of um, the situation when you have rolling what we mentioned in chapter two, rolling with no slip. And the, the one last case will be the case we don't have any simplification, we just simply use the full equation. Let's stay there. So usually we want to find one of the special cases to kind of simplify this equation. Now, here is a little bit detour. Remember where we start. We start started from this example with this bar brought, and after we finish F equals M A, then I told you in part B, we need to use uh, a new equation, which is called Euler's second law. And then we took a little bit detour to talk about what is the moment of inertia and what are the special cases for this uh, the second law. Now next, we want to go back to this example to see how can we use this equation for this particular problem. And if we look at that bar, um, do we have the, any of the cases we just talked about? If we look at movement about different points, for example, point O, point G, point right there where F is, uh, and also about point E. So let's come down here, just copy what we have on that bar. Let's call this O, center of mass G. Let's call this where F hits is, let's call it C, and the bottom point is E. And we do have some special cases. If we look at the movement about point O, and then if we look at point G, and if we look at point E, and you will realize we do have this four cases, and we have this point A where um, a and the G are overlapping, which is the point you're talking about, it's a center of mass. And that's when, if we choose this center of mass G point, right? And that would be our case one. And see if we have, if A, the second case is when A is a fixed point. So everything else is, rotate, is rotating about that point. Do we have case like that? If you look at that bar, the bar can rotate about point O. So if you choose point O, then you will have this case two. And do we have case three? There's a point Q where the acceleration of Q is parallel to um, uh, RG slash Q. And I don't think we have a uh, case three. But of course, you can always, you can use case four for any problems. So for this problem as well. Okay, now let's, uh, I will pick, how about let's do this. Let's pick the sum of movement about G, which is center of mass. Then see, we can write the equation. So M, sum of the movement about G. And as we state here, that's case one and that you end up with some of the moment equal to I A alpha. So this will give us I G times alpha. And first we can write, what are the sum of the moments? In that case, we probably need to copy the free body diagram. Thank you. Let's copy this. OK, 
Okay, so this is a free body diagram. And can you find the sum of the movement about point G? This is a, um, a knowledge you probably learned from statics, right? If um, just you can do this start from all the all forces, each forces. If we start from Ry, so sum of the forces about G equal to start with Ry. Force reaction force Ry is pointing um, J direction and it passed through the center of mass. So as you can see, it passed through the G point G. So the distance between R and G is zero. So it, it creates zero movement. So it's passing through that point G. Let's move on to the next force, which is Rx. Rx, reaction force, and, and the distance between Rx and G, it's half, one half times L. The total length of the bar is half L. And it creates a movement that is clockwise, which is negative. So that's negative Rx times um, L over G. So when the, tr the direction, the signs of movement can be tricky. So one suggestion, one tip for you is before you do this, Define what's the positive direction for movement. So I would do add a positive sign. I would define if the movement caused by the force is counterclockwise, and I will see that movement is positive. So like we just did here, our x, if you have a force pointing that way, and the movement ca caused by that our x about O will be clockwise. So that's negative at that negative sign there. Okay, then we have a weight force here right past the point G. So that weight force creates zero moment and because distance between weight force and the point G is zero. Also we have that um, F force here. The distance between the force F and G, it's uh, H minus L over two. Remember H, it's the distance from zero, from O. Let's go back here. H, it's distance from point O to where that um, ball is hitting the, the rod. So the distance from that point to G, it's H minus uh, L over two. Go back here. That's what the movement caused by this F. And that movement is creating uh, the movement, the direction of movement caused by the F is causing this counterclockwise rotation, therefore it's positive. And do we have more forces? I think that's it. We have one, two, three, four, four, four forces. And we have the four different movements from those forces. Okay. And two of the movements are zero. And this sum of the movement about G, remember here, equals IG times alpha. And in this case, we have a long bar. So IG, it's um, that's movement inertia of the long bar equals IL square over 12. Therefore, IG alpha is going to be ML um, square over. 12 times alpha. And this equal to what we have for the sum of the moment, which is negative Rx times L over two plus force times H minus L over two. So this will give you one more equation. It's called this equation three. Okay. So that's how we use Ruler's second law to find the, a new equation. Besides the um, 
the previous two equations we find. Yep, you know, right here, those two equations are from Newton's law. I use this law to find out one more equation. Okay, then let's see what else we can do here. Mm, if we look at here, and one thing I forgot to mention is, let's look at the relationship between a G. If we have to use a four equation on the case four, then you will need to use this four equation. Then you will have um, x acceleration of a G, right? And um, Another way to look at this is this is also related to what you learn in chapter two, the rigid body kinematics. So when you have a bar that is fixed in, fixed at point O, and the bar is rotating about point O, and if I have a point that's called this G, it's called the acceleration at that point is A G, and if you remember what we learned in chapter two. And there's a relationship between acceleration at point G and acceleration at point O. The equation is goes AG equals to A0, A0 plus alpha plus RG special minus omega square RG special. And that's the equation we learned from chapter two. And if you look at that equation, that's the relationship between point A and point G. We know point O is fixed, so that goes to zero, right? And um, we know right after impact, right at that impact, this omega term is zero as well. Since it's not rotating, it just right at the impact. And from there, we are able to find out the acceleration at point G. It's uh, alpha times L over two, since this term is L over two. That's on um, I direction. So that from the kinematics, and you will get one more equation um, for um, this. You can use that to find out how the relationship between alpha, which is the angular acceleration we have in equation three. This alpha, alpha 10 can be found through the knowledge we learned in chapter two. And in that case, you have one more equation. And once you have all those equations, you should be able to solve up to uh, four unknowns in this problem. Okay, I think we're running out of time now. And, but here is how, why we want to learn a rigid body kinetics. And something different new is Wooler's second equation. And I, we will, we don't have class on Friday, since it's um, Good Friday, so there's no class for the whole campus. And uh, we'll keep learning um, chapter five on Monday and next Monday on Wednesday. All right, any questions, guys? <laughs>